So what are some of the examples of computational social science? And this, now in the following, this last part will basically be uh, a short overview of the content of the course, because that's what we will do in this course, in this introductory course, is to give you an overview of different examples of doing computational social science, and we will expose you uh, to some of the methodologies involved. And we will start with our computational scientific methods and you will see this framework a lot. This framework will guide us through the entire course and we start here in the upper left corner with the empirical work which in computational social science is big data often as I already mentioned uh, the digital footprint that we have. So the digital footprint is really a, a footprint. You can think about this way as the digital footprint that we leave behind for example here with Twitter and we just take this kind of data and then with that try to answer social science questions. For example, this here, what you can see in this video is when somebody in Twitter says, good morning, or buenos dias, guten morgen, buongiorno, and we see wherever we have the digital footprint, there we can also then see, actually we can see when people get up and you can find some interesting things from there. Nobody had to do a survey, nobody had to do an experiment, nobody had to ask anything to anybody. People just you know, get up and say good morning and now we can see some differences uh, in, in, in when people do get up. This year is using also Twitter data in Manhattan, in New York, and we can see where people from different ethnic backgrounds live. So they just see like in what languages do people write on Twitter and you can uh, identify some Russian community, some Korean, some Japanese communities. Again, nobody did a survey, nobody asked anything, but now very clearly actually by block we can identify where people from different ethnic origins live because that's the language they also, they also tweet in. So we're basically kind of like mapping out the world and you with this digital footprint. Now this time we're mapping out the world, we're not mapping it out geographically but socially. So we're doing social side, we advance with that a lot. So in the past uh, we made maps that kind of like look like this, so that's a Monrovia capital a city in Africa. And for a few hundred years, we mapped out the geography of these cities and we knew that in Africa, that's what it actually looks like. Now, at the same time, especially in Africa, only half of the people have a birth certificate. So actually, we don't know how many people there are actually. Really, we don't have any register. We don't have any solid empirical evidence to do social science. The government doesn't know how many people actually live in their country. So mapping out this, uh, this scenario socially is kind of like the first ma map makers when they would write, well, there be dragons, right? We don't know what's behind that. But so this map was done in August 2014. Only a few months later in November 2014, that's what the map looked like. Right, so again, we go from there be dragons here to that, and they could fill out this map knowing actually where people are. How did they do that? What do you think? They used cell phone. They used the digital footprint that people leave behind with their cell phone, and almost everybody, even in Africa nowadays, has a cell phone. So we don't know how many people there are, but if a cell phone walks around the street, we assume that a person is attached to it. Right? So actually, that's the best evidence we have that, that there are people and how many there are. So in this sense, we are measuring out the world and you again with this digital footprint. We can ask a lot of questions, social science questions, that before were either too costly to ask them or also to study. I already talked about the problems of relationships for example, we could look at the digital footprint of what people are worried about in their relationships, what basically what they search on the internet. So if we look at that, what words go together with the words like marriage or relationship, we see the word sexless marriage is by far 
the biggest concern. Whereas in relationships, that's not the biggest problem. In relationship, sexless is, is the second concern that people have. Uh, and make other comparisons. For example, if we see what, what husbands and wives search on the internet, we can see that the search for my husband won't have sex with me and my wife won't have sex with me, that's kind of like equal, right? Here we have both about a thousand. So that's kind of like an equal concern among husbands and wives. However, now if you go into relationships, we can see that my boyfriend won't have sex with me is twice as big of a concern than my girlfriend won't have sex with me. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know what's, what's up with all these boyfriends, right? Now, so this is, again, a digital footprint. It might be that there are sampling issues. Maybe, maybe girlfriends search that more on the internet and boyfriends not. So there are concerns we will have to talk about when we talk with that and if we do computational social science. But there is a lot of more evidence out there. The founder of, of this dating website called OKCupid okay also wrote an interesting book and he basically studied what people are doing on this dating website. And one thing he studied is what are the age of, uh, of, of, of for example, of women uh, and what age of profiles of men do they look at, right? So here, he mapped it out. So we have here uh, the age of women, and we can see that women in their 20s, so for example, with 24, they look for, for guys who are a little bit older, right? So a 24-year-old woman would look for a guy who is like 25, 26. Whereas uh, the ladies in their 40s, for example, with, with 46, 47, they would look for, for younger guys you know, in the late 30s. Uh, so that's why the diagonal is, is kind of like crossed, right? The, the younger ones look for the older ones and the older ones look for the little bit younger ones. So very interesting, just it's the digital footprint. They didn't produce it really, they just looked for that and now we can have evidence of it by studying this digital footprint. What do you think? How does this graph look for men? Yeah, right. That's really that's what he found. <laughs> that's what it looks like. Independent from the age of men, they always look at profiles of, of women who are in their early twenties, like always. And you know, traditionally, that's kind of like that's kind of like been a joke. It's been a kind of like been a running gag. So, for example, you would say it, it's like a party joke, right? So you say, "Hey, dude, you know, women just always say we men are not consistent. We are very consistent. We always like." women in their 20s, <laughs> you know, and it's a joke and we laugh about it, but now we have empirical evidence about it, right? And having this empirical evidence actually makes you think like being a social science researcher, you know, living in a society with a divorce rate of 50%, having a big proportion of children growing up with only one of their biological parents, right? Building societies like that, you start to think like, like what kind of species are we, right? So here we just collect, these, these people did not know they were observed. It's a very big footprint of millions of people. And that's just naturally what they do. So now we, we have the tools also to ask these questions, to go deeper into trying to understand what's going on uh, with this kind of weird thing that we call humans and, and what kind of species we are and try to figure that out in order to see how we can make also society better. And given all these opportunities, often people say uh, that what this big data digital footprint is, it's kind of like equivalent to what the telescope was for astronomy, right? So before the Incas and, and, and ancient cultures, they already looked at the stars and they mapped out an amazing amount of stuff. But with the telescope, we converted astronomy into a science we could finally see and we could see very far uh, with these kind of telescopes. And they say, you know, the digital footprint allows us to finally see society with this level of granularity or what the microscope was for biology. We always had an idea that kind of like that's how cells actually work and behave, but the microscope allowed us to see them. And with that, biology became a really uh, a strong science that allowed us to make predictions because we could understand. And the digital footprint, it's kind of like the equivalent of what the telescope was for astronomy and the microscope was uh, for biology. 
And during this course, we will work with that. So we will work uh, with, with web scraping tools. So basically, you have this digital footprint here on your favorite internet site, and we develop some tools, web scraping tools, that then a machinery that helps us to derive data from that. And with this data, then, we can make analysis. So we, we will develop, develop some web scrapers together. You will develop a web scraper uh, yourself. Uh, we scrape some data in order then to have some empirical observations about society and then to do some analysis, which brings us to our second point of our computational scientific methods analysis and we start with social network analysis just because well society is actually a network a network of people and that's an extremely powerful tool enabled by compute by the digital footprint and by computational techniques so as i already said the social is actually that's actually a network and we are we have networks all around us not only what we nowadays call a social network kind of like an online social network they can also be offline social networks and uh, we found for example uh, james fowler and, and colleagues uh, at, at the university of california in san diego found that even without digital digital networks traditional networks things like happiness are kind of like contagious so even if out of a second and third degree out if a friend of your friend of yours is happy that can kind of like uh, have an effect on your level of happiness as well so these social networks are extremely important uh, entire nations are basically you can think about them as networks. There is an entire cluster of people that basically map out the networks of industry leaders and government leaders and in which gremiums and which board of directors they sit. And uh, you won't be surprised if I tell you, you don't need to map many of these people because it's the same people sitting in industry, sitting in the government, sitting in the committees. And actually what a nation is and how a nation is run, you can very quickly uh, no, map out by, by, by looking at this, the social network that constitutes the, the constitutes the society. And I won't, won't go deeper into that. We have uh, two lectures on social network analysis. One of my mentors, Emmanuel Castells, wrote a thousand page triology on, on the rise of the network society, on the network society. And you can, well, the social is basically the network. You can explain uh, social phenomena in terms of these kind of networks. Now, uh, the computational approach and the digital footprint has been very important in order to reveal these networks. As I said, these networks always existed and they have important effects on us, uh, but these, the digital footprint allowed us to reveal uh, these connections and to make a, sci a more formal science out of it. Computational tools were also very important. Let me show you an example of how important it is if we do social, social sciences. Traditionally, if you would have a social science problem, for example, here we have a bunch of people, we have eight people with different characteristics, and traditionally what we would do is we, we would look at who they are. Okay, so who are these people? Okay, we have eight people. Um, some of them have education. That's why they have, you know, the education head on. Uh, some of them have a computer, so they do computational techniques. And, uh, oh, two of them have red pants. Okay, so there are some characteristics, and now we can make a theory out of that. Let's see if we can find uh, some relationship and see who of these guys do computational techniques and, and who are uh, and who do not. So traditionally, we would, we would look at the characteristics. So with education, without education, with computer, without computer, and then we just count, put them in boxes. Now put people in boxes. So three of them have a computer and have education. One of them has a computer but doesn't have education. One of them has education but no computer. And three of them uh, don't have a computer and don't have education. Then we would do our, fam our favorite analysis technique, for example, least square. We run a correlation, a, a regression, and we can see, mm, yeah, education has something to do with the use of computational tools. Fantastic. Policy recommendation, therefore, would be, well, look at, look at the people who have education. Well, well, not so fast. Maybe the people with the red pants also have to do something with it. Okay, so let's check that. Let's check that with the red pants, just to make sure we're not on the wrong track. Um, we have one person, two person with red pants, one with computer, one without, and three people without red pants and computer, and three people um, 
without red pants and without computers. So there is no relationship here between them, right? We have just as many people with red pants and with computers. So, okay, we proved it. Uh, red pants have nothing to do with it. Don't worry about the red. What should red pants have to do with it, right? So we do our policy good. As I said, focus on the people with education to push computational methods. Now, as an example, uh, it turns out that the network structure is often very important because especially something like innovations, computational methods here being innovation, they spread through social networks. So if we now re would reveal in this hypothetical example, the social network among these people, these people are not all independent. They kind of like hang together and it's not like everybody's connected with everybody. You know? And we often, we do find something uh, like this here. So we have kind of like one cluster on the one side and one cluster on the other side. And in this hypothetical example, the people with the red pants, they do matter. If I want the innovation of computers spread from one side to the other, I actually will have to build a bridge between the people with the red pants. Well, who are the people with the red pants? Well, there are innovators. They are agents of change. They are so innovative, they are wearing red pants, right? So actually, the best way to foster the spread of an innovation, if you look at it from this perspective, that they are social networks, would not be to do something to help the people with education and focus on that. No, you can do a much cheaper intervention by focusing on these kind of innovators, how do you detect them? Well, for example, in this case, I reveal the social network behind it. Now, this is just a hypothetical example, but that's often what we find. And uh, what the digital footprint helped us is to get this additional piece of information. Who hangs together with whom? Before, it was kind of like, you know, ephemeral, tacit. We, we, you knew, but nobody else knew who you were actually hanging out with, and now you leave that behind, and we can analyze that. And, Society is as much about who you are as about with whom you are. It's kind of like your mother told you, right? Be careful with whom you hang out because who you hang out with, whatever, and, and it's true. It's not only about who you are, but tracking social networks, uh, it's, it's only became actually viable in a, in a massive approach thanks to the digital footprint. And now we can analyze these social networks. Now, social networks have very intricate structures. Just, just look at this, this network here. You can see and, and, and analyzing these structures, and we will do that throughout two lectures. In one lecture, we will look at the structure of the network. In the other lecture, we will look at how networks evolve, how they actually change over time, and we will understand more about that. Both of that is very relevant for doing social science because, as I already said, you can, you can get a lot of mileage out of it. For example, you can make policy recommendations to make the world a better place. You can get them much cheaper. Here is an example that used computational social science that controlled the spread of a disease in school. So instead of spreading innovations, I now try to stop the spread of a disease. That also goes through social networks, and we try to contain it. So um, they found out that it's not the red pants, it's children. Children play a very important role in a community in the spread of a disease. So the main policy goal in order to try to prevent the spread of a disease is, for example, well, where are children? They're in schools. So people would, policymakers would just close down schools. For example, that has a very high political and social cost. So if you think close down an entire school, parents have to stay at home so they cannot work for the economy. That's a huge, a huge hit for the economy if you close down a school. All right, so closing down one school is up to $100,000. So but just from the money that the parents lose, the economy doesn't get, doesn't get boosted with that. So let's look for some smarter ways of how we can, we can control the spread of a disease. Well, if we would know the network structure, we can much better see like, well, how can we stop it, right? So computational social science solution is, for example, mapped out here the network, and that's what a network looks like in a school. There are different clusters in a network. Well, no surprise, these are the school classes. And these are school classes, and then different school classes have different grades, and between the grades, for example, among all second grader, they also have a lot of contact, but then in different grades, there's not so much contact. And basically what they showed with a lot of computer simulations, and we will do computer simulations on social networks and study that in detail, what they found actually, if you close down just one class 
a class where there are two infected students, so two ill students, two sick students, uh, that is just as effective as closing down, almost as effective as closing down the school. Now you get 70% of the effect. Now if you close down the entire grade, let's say they are in one class two second graders that are ill, you lo close down all, all second grades, that's still much less than closing down the entire school. You get almost as good as an effect. That's, that's what, what this graph here shows. So uh, how do we get all this social mileage or social policy measure? Well, look at the network structure and analyze and simulate these kind of networks. Try to understand it and thanks to the digital footprint and to computer simulations, uh, we have these, the, these modern insights and can, can help make well, the world a better place, basically. One very important analytical technique in computational social science that we will surely have to talk about is basically artificial intelligence. So we will talk about machine learning and about natural language processing. The idea behind machine learning is basically that we say, well, we have so much data nowadays. Uh, uh, the data is so big, big data that this information processor here is helplessly overwhelmed with processing it. So the reasonable thing to do is we kind of like fight fire with fire. So the digital technology brought us this informational overload. Let's also use digital technology in order to make sense of it, right? So we use machines to learn patterns in this informational overload. So for example, uh, think about books. Uh, if you read one book per day for your entire life, every day you read one book for 80 years, you will read about 30,000 books. Well, that's a lot. And hopefully you will be able to process, well, most of it yeah, in, this, in, the, in this processor here. Now, Google Books has 130 million books. Like, you, you, there's no way, shape, or form you can process that. But Google uploaded them, so they are all there. And actually with machine learning, we can look for patterns. We can look for what's there and what kind of patterns and new patterns maybe that we, we discover of t taking, you know, looking at 130 million books, not only th well, 30,000, that's insane to begin with, uh, but we can look at, well, big, uh, patterns across many different, many different uh, data, data inputs and machines can do that. All right, so machines look for pattern, uh, discover, discover some uh, of, of these benefits, and then what can they do with it? Well, they can do a lot with it. Actually, modern approaches to artificial intelligence only became viable with this big data footprint. The idea of artificial intelligence has been around for a long time, but thanks to this digital footprint that we have, thanks to the massive amount of data, now machines can learn, discover patterns, and do really amazing things. So check out some of the videos I have here for you. This, for example, up here is the Amazon uh, uh, inventory uh, uh, warehouse. So if you click something on an online retailer like Amazon and want to buy something, immediately one of these bots, artificial intelligence bots, gets going and gets your purchase. This over here in the corner, that's what a modern car manufacturing company looks like. Well, there's, there's no person involved here anymore. It's machines who learn the patterns of how to construct a car. It's hundreds of robots working together and if you find a human, it's probably some kind of IT nerd who adjusts the robots, but cars nowadays are basically built by artificial intelligence. And this down here is an example that I want to show you is how quickly these machines can learn. So this is an example of an, uh, an artificial intelligence from Google that plays an Atari game, uh, a very old Atari game. I used to play that as a kid. And the computer, the artificial intelligence, doesn't know anything about the game. It just knows it's kind of like a ping pong ball and it has to collect points. So that's, that's the only two things you tell it it doesn't know how the game works, and that's how quickly it learns how to master the game. Check it out. 
Well, that's pretty impressive, right? The algorithm became innovative. It actually innovated. It figured out that putting the ball on top rattles everything down. It found a, it found a solution, a, a shortcut. I played this game as a kid, uh, and, and probably for more than a few hours, <laughs> and I didn't figure that one out. I mean, there are people who figured that out, uh, but honestly, AI won me for sure. I mean, found a very creative solution for that. And, and often, that's what we often find. So if we let machine learning loose on this data, it finds some kind of patterns that this processor here was not even aware of that existed. Sometimes it's also, we look then at this black box of machine learning, and we don't even still don't know after looking at it, what it actually did and why it is so much better than humans in doing what it does. Uh, and it became better than humans in many, many areas. For example, in radiology, the, the discovery of cancer cells. Nowadays, artificial intelligence there is more reliable. And of course, with self-driving cars and we could go on. It's, so, it's, it's, it's more secure even uh, than people. We can go on and on. Artificial intelligence is winning us every day with something and it does so by looking through these massive amounts of data and discovering, discovering patterns, creating knowledge. And that's what computational science is about, right? So machine learning can help us with that. And additionally, it leads us to the point, what are we actually doing when we, when we create new knowledge? What are we doing when we do science? Uh, well, we use intelligence in, in order to discover something new, but what is intelligence? And working with artificial intelligence, we also happen to understand much more what this entire idea is about of intelligence. And that's, that's nothing new. We, we, we often look at our technologies and then actually understand what something is about. For example, Look at flight, human flight, right? We, we always thought uh, something flying uh, has to do with feathers because the only things we, we usually saw flying in human history were birds. So uh, from Da Vinci to anybody else, we always thought like, oh, we need feathers and, and need to flap them probably in, in order to be able to fly. Uh, we had no idea what aerodynamics actually is. The brothers Wright, not too long ago, a hundred and something years ago, the first time they were flying for 30 meters for a hundred feet, they almost killed themselves. They had no idea how this stuff works. So they built the first flying machines, quite dangerous, without knowing what they were doing. Well, those two survived, many others, many others didn't, but then it, we were, you know, gambling at that point. But then once we had these flying machines, oh, we could take them apart and look inside and start to understand what flying, what flying actually is. Well, what actually is flying? But it doesn't have to do with feathers, it has to do with the curvature of the wings. So if you see these huge airplanes often, they have these little tiny wings, but they're curved and actually with suction, they are sucked up. Well, then we understood what this actually, what this thing is about, right? And we could build all kind of different flying machines then. Flying machines that nature never came up with. Helicopters, fighter jet planes, uh, and rockets. And after the brothers Wright, only 60 years later, 60 years later, we were flying to the moon. Nature never invented something that could fly to the moon, at least not on, on this planet as far as we know. Evolution never came up with that. But once we understood the principle of what it actually is, we were doing things that nature, with this evolutionary tinkering, never came up with. And we, we understood all kind of flying uh, techniques and, and, and approaches because we understood the framework of what aerodynamic actually is. So something similar is happening right now with intelligence. Nature came up with one solution to the intelligence problem. And that's what nature came up with. That's kind of like the birds and the feathers. Now, seeing how machine learns, we actually start to understand there are different kinds of intelligence. It's, it's, it's starting to, we're starting to have a glimpse of the bigger picture, what it actually is to create knowledge, what it is to learn by these machines that we create that actually do exactly that. And these machines get so good at it that it actually becomes a little bit scary. And that brings us to a discussion. If you open the newspaper nowadays, you see it, you know, you see it. We don't have to go to the Terminators 
and to you know to 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 how artificial intelligence will will kill us off because we are the inferior species. We no need to go there. We many people are worried that artificial intelligence is taking their jobs, for example, and even you know the biggest company on planet companies on planet Earth that do that they do much do machine learning artificial intelligence massively. They have a very healthy dose of respect towards it, which led to one initiative that many companies now open up their artificial intelligence. So if you want to do artificial intelligence, companies like Google and Amazon, they open up, well, they open up, you know, an empty brain, an empty artificial brain. They don't tell you how they trained it. It's kind of like, you know, their business value is still with that. For 20 years, they've been training this have been training this brain. So they have the data they trained it with. It's kind of like they have a university graduate Whereas what they give to you is kind of like a newborn baby. You can train it yourself and it's available and during the course we will play. We will play with some of the artificial intelligence that's opened up uh, by companies, that, by, by big companies that, that do artificial intelligence and we will be able to play, play with it uh, in order to do some, some machine learning for, for ourselves. We have a lab of doing that. And we will have to learn that. We will have to cooperate with intelligence. Traditionally, we're always afraid of that, of a new technology, because it might be taking our job, it, jobs, it might replace us. And that's a very old fear. It's an old story, you know, in the 18th, in the 18th uh, hundreds, uh, the Luddites famously destroyed cotton and weaving machines because they were taking their jobs. They thought like, oh my goodness, with these cotton and weaving machines, there won't be work anymore. Well, 200 years later, we still have work. We just don't use cotton and weaving machines. We automated that. And there are many tasks in intelligence that we kind of like automating and we start to cooperate now with these machines. And that's something if we go to one of the founders of computers, of computer science, John von Neumann, and he famously said, well, the best we can do is to divide all processes into those things which can be done better by machines and those which can be done better by humans and then invent methods to pursue them too. So that was the idea since the beginning of, of computer science. And we have to have methods to cooperate, collaborate with our machines. Interestingly enough, that's also what we've been finding uh, when we try to, to match ourselves with the machines. Of course, the first vision would always be, oh my good, who, goodness, who is stronger? The human or the machine? Man against machine, right? Think about chess. So in the late 1990s, the end of last century, we lost that battle in chess. Right. We took our best chess player, Gary Kasparov, we went it against a computer from IBM, Deep Blue, and we lost that one. We really did, and that's been, that's been, many, that's been several decades ago now. Right? So, uh, and, and we see AI always advancing. Interestingly, afterwards, Kasparov, you know, he had a couple of choices of what to do. He could have gone home uh, studying more chess, or he could have, you know, gone home and buried himself in uh, hiding in the woods and say, oh my goodness, the machines are too powerful, even more powerful. Uh, but actually what he did is he started to cooperate with these machines. He started to invent something called freestyle chess uh, or centauri chess, where actually then, uh, you know, computers are allowed and you play chess with the computers. What they found there is that the most successful teams were not the grandmasters and also not the supercomputers. Interestingly enough, also not the supercomputers and the grandmasters. It was actually teams that were very good in cooperating with, with these machines. So let's say one IT guy and one you know, media chess player, but they were very good buddies and they really knew what to do and they cooperated with the machines very well and they were beating the grandmasters with the supercomputers. So actually the best we can do is also, Get in touch with machine learning, separate these processes. What can machines do better in discovering knowledge? And what can we do better? And then cooperating with them and we find out that this is the most powerful approach also to do science. And in that sense, do computational science, computational social science especially. And that brings us to our last leg of, of computational scientific methods, and that's theory. So we can also do theory with the help of computers. We often do that with simulations. So we simulate theoretical scenarios that not necessarily exist in empirical reality. For example, here I show you a simulation from the United States Army uh, simulating 
uh, for example, uh, 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 an occupation strategy in different in different countries and how many soldiers are needed when in order to provide security. Here you can see a chemical attack in Los Angeles. There has never been a chemical attack in Los Angeles, but we can simulate it and just see like, well, what would happen? How would people move? How would people run? And here we simulate traffic in Chicago, which uh, is calibrated by, 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 by cell phone data, for example. And we can see like these little hills is where there are traffic jams, right? You can see, and then we can uh, simulate what would happen if you would change the traffic lights. Uh, and if you change the traffic lights this way and that way, and nobody has to suffer because we just theoretically explore what would happen. And once we find a good solution to reduce traffic jams, then we would implement it, right? So we do computer simulations uh, of, some of, of some scenarios that never really existed. Why is it important and why, does that, why, does that, why is it so important for, 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 for the social science especially? Well, uh, if we only go by data, by empirical approaches, data can only tell us what already happened in the past. Because data, per definition, is always from the past. I mean, the minute you record it, the moment already passed, and then you have data, even if it's real time data, you know, it's, it's still, it's always from the past. Now you analyze the past, what extrapolations can you do? So for example, imagine you analyzed the past and you can see here this kind of tendency. How do you think this tendency will continue? And there is nothing, nothing in the data that allows you to actually, to actually say otherwise, right? The data statistics forces you to continue to extrapolate that because only in the data there's nothing different. But in theory, it might continue like this, right? Maybe there's something and, or, or we might want to change it. So either there's kind of like a phase transition, it just changes the stationarity of the series is broken, that would be the technical term, or we ourselves intervene because we want to make the world a better place, right? Now, we don't have data about a world without poverty, without pollution, and we don't have data about that. But in theory, we can think about how to do that, uh, right? And, and with that, we can extrapolate these kind of like phase changes even. And that's in social science very important because more uh, is often different. And we often find these nonlinear phase transitions in social sciences. It, it's, it's easier if you think about it in terms, for example, of physics, we find them in all kinds of sciences. So in physics, for example, if you have water, right, you, you can heat up water and heat up water and heat up water, it's still water, but then suddenly at 100 degrees Celsius, more Celsius is make suddenly has a different result, it becomes a vapor. And then you have the water and you cool it down, you cool it down, it's still water, it's still liquid. And then at zero degrees Celsius, more cooling suddenly has a different effect. It becomes ice, right? So there are these, these phase transitions, and we see them in society a lot. If you do public policy, these are the ones you want to detect because you kind of like invest, you invest and invest, and you want to see like when the system, where these tipping points where you can actually flip, uh, flip the system. And just with statistical extrapolation, you cannot really get to it once you didn't observe them and often you have never observed them uh, in, in, your, in your, even in your digital footprint, they are, are not there. And social society is riddled with these kind of nonlinear phase transition. Schumpeter, an important economist, economist of innovation, uh, famously said that the history of capitalism, for example, is studied with violent bursts and catastrophes. We come to the conclusion that evolution of the social system is a disturbance of existing structure and more like a series of explosion than a gentle through incessant transformation. So actually we have, you know, revolutions basically change society. And it's not like a continuous thing. It started with bursts and explosion with revolutions, be it technological revolutions, innovations, and so forth. And, and we have to understand them. And, and just extrapolating of what has been in the past won't allow you to detect the impacts of a new technology for example, uh, and won't you often allow you to detect, well, many things that happen. Why is that, especially in social science, is because these nonlinearities, where do they come from? Well, often they come from interdependencies 
among us, right? They are, they are not linear. They are, but in societies, we are highly interdependent. And therefore, we influence each other. And, and this leads to these kind of nonlinear behaviors. Let me show you just to give you a little intuition about that. So here you have a growth model. So they have a model of growth, and we have bunnies. Bunnies, of course, grow, so we have two bunnies. And they both reproduce, and they always double. So one bunny doubles to, now each one has a duplicate. Now we have two bunnies on each side, right? And, and, and the two duplicate, so now we have four, and now the four duplicate, okay, so we get eight on each side. If we sum that up now, let's take a societal view. Here we have two families of bunnies. Let's take a look from the society. We put these two families of bunnies together, right? The same thing should happen. Okay, so a linear approach to that would be we have two bunnies and then we go to four, then we go to eight, and then we go to 16. So if we extrapolate that forward just by summing up individuals, summing up families in order to get society, a linear extrapolation, that's what it would give us. Now, what we often find is non-linearities. Why is that? Because there are interactions among us. So, for example, there is some carrying capacity. We cannot have, imagine we have the scenario that we, we cannot have more than four bunnies on this piece of grass just because there is not enough grass. So there's interaction now, competition between the bunnies, and what's the effect? Well, if we go by our first model, we have well, two bunnies, one on each patch of grass, and the two bunnies together on one patch of grass, and then they reproduce. So we have, now we have two and two and four on the other side. What happens now? What happens if both of these sides reproduce once more? Well, on the one side, just looking at it in a separate, they can still reproduce because I said the carrying capacity is at four. Four, a patch of grass can, can, can nurture four bunnies. But on the other hand, we already ran out of resources. So there is this kind of non-linearity that we often find. Where does it come from? Well, because we affect each other. So more is different. We cannot just extrapolate data. And if we have more people on planet Earth, and if a new technology comes, and if we continue in this tendency, it won't go on like this forever. We have to then also see theoretically what we can, what we can do in order to solve it. And we do this with these kind of computer simulations. It's kind of like playing SimCity. Do you know SimCity? Well, yeah, that's what it looked like when I was a kid playing with it, a teenager playing with it. <laughs> that's what it looks like today. Yeah, I know, really unfair, really frustrating. <laughs> and what I did here with SimCity, SimCity EDU, that's actually a software they use in high school nowadays in order to teach children. Here, that's a simulation of uh, how, what, so studying the effect of sustainable alternative energy sources on the employment of a city. So here we have a power plant, a coal power plant, and I just bulldoze that. I don't want coal power plants anymore. I change the course of history. I bulldoze these coal power plants uh, and I, I then see what happens. I want to create some other, a, a small wind power plant. Okay, alternative energy, I put a wind power plant there. Let's see what happens. Whoa, the city is dangerously low in power right now. Okay, let's put a large solar power plant next to it. And now we made the transition and now I can study society. Now, this society does not exist in reality. I just made it up. There's, there's no city like this that has only clean energy, actually. I, I made it up and I can see now what happens. Okay, so if you ever played SimCity, you see these amazing things like, oh, for example, wow, people start to together and protest in front of City Hall. Oh, interesting. Just like policymakers, as I told you, I've been working in the United Nations for 15 years, and that's policymakers. They are as surprised as you and me about like, whoa, unemployment went up. Oh, there's a social protest. Oh, it's not like, you know, just like us, it's really surprising. It's a very complex system. Well, if something goes well, they always said, well, that, I intended that. But having intentions in such a you know, complex system is really, really difficult. But with computational tools, we can now explore kind of like the, the space of possibilities and we don't have to intervene in society. We don't have to change. We, don't, we, we can simulate digital twins of our society and explore some things and, and, and kind of like weed out some alternatives that we do not want to pursue in practice. 
Now, there's a lot of work to do in that field of these non-linear interactions that we can simulate and see things, how they might go forward, even so we don't have any empirical data. To say it in the world of, of Stanislav uh, Ulam and John from Newman, which I already presented, uh, using a term like non-linear science is like referring to the bulk of zoology as the study as non-elephants. <laughs> right? Yeah, like ev almost everything. Almost everything is nonlinear. The only thing that's linear is linear. And there's only one way you can make a line. There's an infinite numbers of how you can not draw a line, a nonlinear thing. So there's a lot of science to be done. And uh, for our generations, there are a lot of low hanging fruits that we can pick, but for our generation, especially with these computational tools, it's not easy, it's not easy to be solved. The, 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 the realm of possibilities is just too big and uh, we have to go forward exploring that. If you uh, want to know more about this argument, I have an entire TED talk uh, that I gave uh, about this topic, about the limitations of working only with data and why we want uh, also work with computer simulations. If you want, please go ahead and, and, and check out this TED talk of mine. Oof. All right, uh, uh, that's been a lot, uh, and I hope you didn't watch all of that just in one sitting, um, uh, because there are too many things uh, involved that I, uh, that I showed you here. Um, uh, let's try to wrap it up. Let's try to wrap it up and see, take a look again in our entire framework of what we're doing here in this course. I said, well, we start with empirical data, we go over analytical to the theoretical, and that's bringing it all together that's actually the promise of computational science, in that case of computational social science. And there are big opportunities of bringing the empirical, the analytical, and the theoretical together with these, with these kind of new tools. And in the social sciences, uh, I already said the social sciences traditionally people have questioned, is that really a science or is it more art? Like we in, in natural science, we do science, right? In social, I don't know, that's more like, you guys cannot make which, but nowadays actually, the social science has become maybe the only data complete science that we have, right? Uh, other sciences don't have as much data as we have historically. You know, historically, we were running experiments on, yes, true, on a collection of undergraduates who needed extra credit. And we were running them through a lab and like 60 at a time. And then we made grand conclusions about that's how society works. But nowadays, we have actually a tracker and each one of us leaves a lot of information behind. And that's very different from other sciences. So for example, if you think about ecologists, they wanted to do that. They wanted to actually do a computer simulation of all life on Earth. Now, they don't know where the fish are in the ocean, and they officially said, right, the biggest stumbling block is obtaining the data to parameterize and validate uh, the model. So they had automated cameras uh, at the bottom of ships and plankton recorders and they set up videos in the jungle to see when the puma comes out and to monitor where the fish is. But you know, they, they, they don't have the data where all life actually is. But we as an evolved species, we leave that behind either with our credit cards or with our mobile phone or with our social networks and all seven plus billion people on planet Earth basically in one shape, form or another uh, leave this digital footprint now, up, now, now behind. And that allows us then to calibrate these kind of computational models that I was showing you and basically study society. So there's a lot of promise that social science was traditionally was one of the weaker sciences, now actually comes along and, and during the next century uh, becomes, well, one of the sciences where we make most advances. And, and it's a very exciting field. We see physicists, biologists, and so forth flocking into the social sciences because of the big opportunities that are there. I want to leave you with one last caveat, which is very important, especially when we do social science, because in social science, we often also, with our results, affect society. Right? That's different from other sciences. If you are Mr. Newton, and you study how the moon goes around the earth and the earth goes around the sun, once you figure that out, well, you figure that out, 
And then, well, maybe as a result of that, maybe, yeah, you can fly to the moon a, a few hundred years later, but, yeah, it didn't really change how the moon goes around. It didn't change that scenario. In social science, right, often when we figure something out, we then also intervene. And it's very important to remember that all models, all science is wrong. And we will talk about this in this course as well at the end of the course later. But, but some of it is useful. Now, it's wrong. How can you imagine that? Because we always have a snapshot snapshot of, of reality. So, for example, you do network analysis. That might be your network that you analyze. But the truth is it's part of a bigger network, which is even part of a bigger network. But you might as well take in the same big network, so these two are the same, and, and cut the pie a different way. Now, you have two models of this reality that have you, and, and they lead to different conclusions, right? So, the only model that you could really work with, the only working model of society would be society itself. Well, that would mean you have to, need to have society on your desk. You cannot even have society in your computer. You have to abstract from it because you would have to build a one-to-one -one model of society. You might as well use this. That doesn't work. So actually, all models are abstractions. We leave stuff out, and that makes them all wrong. And that can lead to, to very important consequences. I want to leave you with one example, a recent example, of, of Alan Greenspan. That's the longest serving chair of the Fed, of the Federal Reserve of the United States, basically the person in charge of monetary policy in the country, the longest uh, serving chair of the Fed. And when the economic crisis hit in 2008, he was called to Congress and he was asked about in Congress, in the United States Congress, what went wrong, Mr. Greenspan? Why, why didn't we see that coming? So many million people are suffering right now around the world. This had big, big echoes. You could feel actually in very poor countries as well. People not only losing houses here in the United States, people went hungry because of this economic crisis. So why didn't we see that coming? And check out this little clip here to understand uh, what Mr. Greenspan had to say in his defense. So he basically said a few things I want to point out. He said, well, I made a mistake by presuming that my model was actually wrong. He literally said, I found a flaw in the model that I perceived is the critical functioning structure that defines how the world works. So he had a model how the world works, and that's how he operated the biggest monetary pool in the world, the United States. And then he found out, whoops, I... Uh, there was a flaw in my model, right? And that had big, uh, big implications for many people. So when you do social science, it's not only exciting and very relevant, it also has severe consequences. And that leads us to our last point. If you have the wrong model, uh, it can be that you have very good intentions. I don't say Mr. Greenspan had uh, bad intentions. He might have had very, very good intentions. And that's how he testified in Congress, right? I, I just wanted to do the best thing. But his model was wrong. Uh, and that that can be very counterintuitive because uh, you know usually in in a comic world it's very simple to say you know good people do good things and bad people do bad things so they are the superheroes and the villains right but in reality it's more like you know there are some good people who do bad things and there are bad people who who do good things and, and that might be very counterintuitive but it happens all the time in social sciences, right? That's why we also have to be aware of our models and how important, how influential the outcomes are of doing social science. And that brings us to our last point of what we will have to talk about in this course, and that is research ethics. We really have to see if we do social science, we have to, well, first of all, make sure that we follow the scientific principles, that we don't do harm when we do it, when we follow these scientific principles, and that then as an outcome as well, you have to be very aware of what's the outcome of our conclusions, uh, because it more often than not will affect real people. All right, that now really wraps it up. We kind of like rattled through three questions. First question is, why computational social science and why computational social science now? And I said, well, 
two things. First of all, the technology is, is there. It's all over society, great opportunities, many low hanging fruits that we can exploit in order to understand society better. And second of all, because social science, we don't really understand it. We, we don't understand society as well. That also leads to the fact that there are many discoveries to be made, many Nobel Prizes to be won, and I hope you will join us uh, in this pursuit. Uh, second, what does computational social science cover? And I basically said, well, it affects all of the scientific method. And, and we developed this framework that we will actually go through during this course and we will come back to repeatedly uh, see the different aspects of traditional scientific methods and how we can do them computationally. And last but not least, I went through some of the examples of computational social science and the rest of the course, that's what we will do. We'll go through some examples. We will do some hands-on exercises in some labs. So you will work with web scraping. You will do social networks. You will work with artificial intelligence, with machine learning, and then we bring it all together. We will do computer simulations. You'll do computer simulations and then bring it all together at the end. Web scrape, do social networks, run it through machine learning and do a computer simulation. And at the end of the course, all of that will have been brought together. And we run through this uh, cycle of, of computational sci social scientific methods together, uh, hopefully a, a few times so we get really comfortable with it and we get exposed to the different ways we can do science, social science nowadays. All right, I hope you enjoyed this, this first introduction as much as I did. <laughs>